Okay, I'm sorry. It has been a very, 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 should I go off screen with this? Probably not. It's been a very long time um, since we've dropped an episode. So I'm really sorry about that, guys. I actually had uh, my best friend in the world over last week, Josh Bennett, and um, he yelled at me so he yelled at me a lot for saying sorry so much. So sorry for saying sorry so much. <laughs> but um, I know it's been a long time. And it's not just that it's been a long time. It's that in the last, shoot, month, there's been so much stuff going on um, when it comes to perpetrators being outed and uh, the IFB just spiraling out of control. Right now I'm debating um, about this hat because I have... I love fitted ball caps, and I, and I usually wear them forward. I might flip it and wear it forward because uh, when I wear fitted ball caps, you can see uh, what happens to the ears. Plus, having the glasses on doesn't help, but my hair is a disaster. And so I couldn't have you guys see that again. I know I've posted them before when it's bad. So enough about me. A uh, little bit of housekeeping. Yeah, I'm going to flip this around. <laughs> there you go. How about that? Cubbies. Cubbies for life. Uh, let me hear you, Cubbies fans. So... Um, but the only problem with this is I, my light is in my studio, uh, is coming straight down. And so it's going to be funny watching the shading go back and forth. All right. Anyways, whatever. Who cares? Let's just put it further up so you can see more of my five head. Uh, that's too much. There we go. That's good. You can tell I'm awkward at this. I obviously haven't done it in like months. So this is going to be a solo cast and, uh, probably 15, 20 minutes in, you're going to see my outfit change. It's just how it's going to work tonight, today today not tonight whenever this posts um but man have we got some amazing uh exciting stuff to cover and i'm excited to share it all with you i've definitely um seen the things going on if you're a personal friend of mine on facebook you've noticed uh, that we've been talking about uh what's going on in um on the east over on the east coast and what's going on in jacksonville florida um but first a few housekeeping things and i know i think i I know, I think, <laughs> I think I might have uh, referenced this before, but um, first and foremost, thank you to those of you uh, who helped us uh, purchase, and I feel terrible about this, I'm sorry, again, um, <laughs> but I said, you know, oh, we need a computer, and it's going to help us to uh, produce uh, episodes and, and, and get the, you know, get more content to you guys, and then you guys helped me buy one, and then it's been like two months since I posted an episode <laughs> and the last one was like, I think a 10 minute one we did with Chloe. So anyways, for, uh, let's start with that and thank once more, uh, uh Shauna for helping us, uh, Janine J for helping us and, uh, my friend Josh Bennett for helping us, uh, buy this computer here. This is terrific. It's amazing. Um, and it's going to be a huge help to continue to push the podcast forward. So continuing with housekeeping, um, Again, my apologies. The truth is I have been, I have not, I have wanted to put out podcasts, especially with everything that's going on. Guys, like I've been wanting to put out podcasts left and right. Like if I, if I had the time to put one out every day and just ramble, if you guys would even listen to it, I would have been doing that <laughs> for the last, I don't know, two or three weeks. But, um, I just, man, I've been so slammed and it's a good thing. Um, you know, things are, things are going well and I'm grateful for that. However, it's just been frustrating for me because I want to put all this content for you guys. I want us to engage in these conversations. And I know, I know, I know, um, I did a poll a little while ago and you guys told me, Hey, Stuart, if you could go ahead and do more produce and just chill with this live stuff, that'd be great. I know that's not exactly what you said, but we got more votes for live or, or for produced content than we did for live content. And I ain't mad at it. I totally get it. Um, for me, I just, I just want to express this in our housekeeping moments here, which is probably going to be, I'm, I think I'm going to maybe... I don't know, there has never been much structure to this podcast, but I think maybe in the future that'll be, especially when I miss a chunk like I have, and I hope that this doesn't happen again, where we got about two months or so um, without a podcast. I know, I'm sorry, right, again. Um, but, you know, I think the housekeeping thing is necessary, and I like it, just kind of doing a little bit of business with you guys in the beginning, because um, I don't think I'm a big deal, I don't think... Uh, I'm anything special, but I think the podcast is a big deal because I think you guys as a community are a huge deal and I love to see your interaction and uh, I love to see you know comments come in, messages come in and all the positive energy that you bring to uh, the people that come on the podcast and myself included. So thank you guys for that. It's a little side rant. Uh, but continuing with housekeeping, um, uh, we we have a lot of we have a lot of stuff going on. So again, I am 
really sorry that it's taken me forever to get to this, but hopefully over the next week or two, um, I've got a little bit of a little more free time than usual, and so my goal is to give you one, maybe two live episodes, and uh, give you one, maybe nah, not. Let's not say two. One produced episode, which is this one um, here over the next uh, few days. So, man, I I don't know where to start. There's just so much going on. Um, but sorry, back to housekeeping really quick. Uh, I do want to say that I've, if I'm being completely honest, I love the live episodes, and I know that everyone who's watching here right now may either not have seen one, or you've never heard of Not Your Mother's Podcast before, or uh, you didn't enjoy the live episode, and I get that. It's totally fine. It's, it's, uh, you, you get to have your own opinion. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. But I want to say to those of you, from me, to those of you that have engaged with me on those live episodes, I want to say, man, thank you so much. And those of you that have engaged with the people that we've had on, I had uh, my mother on, I had, uh, we, we've had Sarah Jackson on, uh, and we've had, a, I want to say one or two other people on, maybe that's it, I think it's just my mom and Sarah Jackson, actually, that have come on the live episodes, but man, you guys, you're, you're, you're bolstering, your encouragement, and I love, love, love when we get, that, get down to the last, I don't know, hour or so, I don't know if you can see when I turn my head, but it's a World Series, is that it? No, that's New Era, well, I screwed that up, World Series, ha <laughs> Cubs, you know, anyway, so, what? When we get down to the last hour, half an hour or so, and I keep closing, <laughs> like a typical Baptist preacher, I love, 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 love it when you guys make fun of me for that. It's so much fun. Anyways, all that to say, I love the, I, I, I love all of it. I love everything. But the uh, produced ones I enjoy and the live ones are near and dear to my heart uh, for two reasons. One, it's easier for me, let's be honest. But also, and more importantly, I get to, did I say number one and then more importantly is number two? Scratch that, reverse it. Number two is it's easier for me to produce. Number one, and most importantly, is that I feel like we really get to vibe a lot more, and uh, I get to, you know, our, our guests get to answer your questions, and uh, I get to answer your questions as well. And also, you know, we just get to have a fun conversation. And um, I think I said this on a live podcast before, but I feel a little bit alienated because I'm over here on the West Coast, and I've got some amazing, incredible friends. You've seen John Warden on the podcast before. I need to get Prince Aloisio on the podcast, great, great friend of mine. Got him, an amazing group of friends out here in Southern California, but... I'm from the Midwest, and my family's there, and I got a lot of great friends there. So um, I really enjoy the podcast because I feel like it lets us have that communication that we might not have otherwise, or whether we'd have it otherwise or not, it's a fun time to communicate. So almost done with housekeeping. Last thing I need to show you guys, I, I don't know, I don't know if any of you watch uh, Hot Ones. I love Hot Ones. Sean Evans, um, almost forgot his last name there for a second. But uh, he has a thing where for a long time, I don't think he does it anymore, but for a very long time, he actually would uh, have, and I think he's kind of back to it. I just watched an episode with Idris Elba uh, where he has a different hoodie. Like he would have a different hoodie every episode, which is really fun for me. So I don't think I have the wherewithal to do this, uh, but uh, the one and only amazing Keanu Robinson has gifted me with a new pop vinyl. And in fact, I have several new pop vinyls. One of them's kind of hiding up here. If you can figure out I don't think he, let me make sure. Yeah, so if you can screenshot or zoom in and figure out who this one is, I give you mad props, and maybe we'll see if we can give you a gift of some sort. I don't have any cool stickers or anything yet. Uh, working with, uh, oh boy, that's going to be fun, huh? <laughs> working with a dear friend of mine from college on a new logo and all that fun stuff. So we'll keep you updated on that as well, probably the next uh, housekeeping part of an episode. But um once that's done, then we should get some stickers. What do you think? Let me know. Drop me a comment. If you would like to see stickers or merch for our podcast, I'm not going to print you a bunch of t-shirts. I'd love to, but it'd cost me more to do them. I'd end up having to charge you guys 40 bucks for a t-shirt. I'm not sure. I'm not roots of fight. I'm not trying to do that. Anyways, uh, I'd love to, um, but I run out of space, and I already am out of space, as you can see, uh, in the studio. Um, but I'd love to premiere a new pop vinyl every episode. That'd be fun. But at least for the next couple episodes, I'll be able to do that. Next four or five, actually, because Kiana gave me some pretty awesome ones. This is a almost a, a, a meta-level um, pop vinyl. I, I know it's not a big deal to you guys. It's fine. But if you like pop vinyls, which are these little, which is the 2010 and beyond. Well, well, geez, it's almost 220 now. It's the millennials bobbleheads. Shall, shall we say that? Uh, the young adults bobbleheads. Um, and uh, that's what they're. Anyways, this one is Phoebe. I don't know if you can see her, and if you're listening, I'm sorry, because you're really missing out. It's Phoebe as uh, Supergirl, which is super meta, because Superman is my guy. I don't know if you've seen the poster that my brother gifted me here. Uh, he also painted for me an incredible 
um, Superman uh, emblem, the symbol of hope, uh, a painting for me several years ago at Christmas. And I got Christmas Christmas stuff. I do have Christmas stuff all over the place, but I got Superman stuff everywhere. So Phoebe, I love friends. And then this is her dressed up for Halloween as Supergirl. So that's super, super cool. Anyways, that's the last of the housekeeping things. So now the first thing I want to read to you guys um, is from our dear, dear friend who has been a guest uh, previously on a live episode. And uh, give me a moment because I fl flipped over to see something that Scott Fowler wrote to me. But, okay, housekeeping. If you have not heard, and I don't know if you like it or not, and a lot of you guys, not a lot of you guys, but a lot of my um, dear, dear friends who are no longer uh, independent fundamental Baptists don't necessarily appreciate Southern Gospel music anymore. And I don't blame you guys for that whatsoever. But if you do still appreciate Southern Gospel music, I'm trying to release this, to release this the same weekend that this came out. Legacy 5 dropped a single, and they are back. It's so good. So uh, check that out if you get the opportunity. I don't know where it's streaming. Nick Coates told me it's on YouTube, and I know it's on Spotify for sure, so probably on Apple Music as well. All right, anyways, so uh, I don't know why. I just need to tell you that. I want to find this. This is what I want to start with. I know I'm kind of teasing a little bit here and there as far as I think you know what we're going to talk about, um, but I haven't mentioned the specific subject yet, and we'll get into it. But I want to lead with a comment from our dear friend and friend of the podcast and friend of all humans, uh, the amazing Sarah Jackson. And I don't want to do her a disservice by not leading with this statement that she posted publicly on her Facebook. So Sarah Jackson says, 15 months, 455 days, I have cried, I have prayed, I have been through hell and back watching my character, my integrity, and my family's character be being shredded for speaking up. Today, God's timing was revealed. Today, Cameron Giovanelli was arrested for sexually abusing me in high school. The journey isn't over, but we just made a massive step, crying tears of relief tonight. So, we got a lot to say about that, right? There's so many things to say. But first and foremost, my God, what a journey it's been for Sarah Jackson. And, um, you know, just the utter... Uh, uh, is reprehensibility a word? Just the utter crassness and the utter um uh, just the ridiculous pride from Cameron Giovanelli for the last year year and a half to be posting and saying so again from you know he literally fled literally from near me here in I think it's Lancaster North Valley Baptist Church Golden State Baptist College took off from there went all the way to Florida to hang out with the Neils we know why he's with the Neils we'll read about that in a little bit we've already talked about the Neils voyeurism just some nasty dudes and I'm working on getting a guest on a podcast that grew up uh, near Jacksonville, uh, Jacksonville, Jacksonville, and uh, is familiar with him uh, from high school through college. And uh, he could be a great resource for us, so we'll have him on eventually. Um, good, good friend of mine. But um, the, the, the thing that just blows my mind is how these guys act. And these guys being Cameron in this instance, Cameron Giovanelli. So the, the start of it was, man, we, we fled. We, we took off. We left uh, California. We ran to Florida. And then as soon as they get to Florida, they filmed that weird video that we posted. I think it, it'll probably be the last post or one of the last couple posts uh, if you scroll down a little bit. Um, and it's a little pixelated. Sorry, <clears throat> sorry, Cameron. I, I don't think him and Greg, Tom, Neal are uh, super familiar. I think they are now because their um, college video was a lot better. But that one was filmed not 1080p. So, look, I, I did the best with what I had. Okay. Um, but that's in an old uh, YouTube video um, or, or an old podcast from us as well. But uh, Cameron fled, fled to Florida and then proceeds to shoot this video that, you know, our marriage is good and just talking all kinds of weirdness and weirdness from the outside looking in. If we were on the inside still, we'd be like, well, yeah, that's, that's the man of God. And he's, he's, uh, he's, you know, calling out this, not calling out, but he's saying, you know, these, these charges are baseless and there's nothing to them. And I'm the man of God and yada, yada. And he's doing the right thing. He's the man of God. And I can tell, I can guarantee you six, seven, eight years ago when I was still in this mess, I would have absolutely looked at that video, maybe shared it, definitely commented and said something um, to the effect of, you know, way to go Cameron for standing up for what's right and for not letting someone assassinate your character. And then he got arrested a year and a half later. So, so there's that, <laughs> but and it's not really a laughing matter. I don't know why I'm laughing, but the, eh, it's kind of funny, but the point that I want to make is it is crazy to me 
that he's maintained. He didn't just maintain, he accelerated, right? So at the beginning it was, oh, I'm innocent and these charges are baseless and God God bless you, happy 4th of July. By the way, that video was deleted within three or four days, less than a week. And uh, then he's working at uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church, uh, Pastor Greg Neal. Uh, is it Greg or Tom? It's Greg, because I think Tom is just uh, fat evangelism now. I'm fat too, so whatever, I can say it. Um, Tom is just fat evangelism now. Tom and, and, and Bob Sr. out of that church. So, uh, so he goes to where Greg is, and not only is he consistently posting. Uh, who posted this the other day? I'm trying to remember, because someone uh, shared his post with a comment. I think it was John Bannister. Um, but man, it was hilarious because the guy is posting, continuing after he knows that he's going to get arrested after all this stuff starts hitting the fan. And I am going to try to, it's not going to be perfectly PG, but I'm going to do my best. But the material that we're going to cover is not going to be PG at all. So cursing or not, just so you know, uh, we're going to read details from these articles. Uh, I should have said that in the housekeeping. Um, but, uh, we're going to read some very sordid details, uh, from these articles. So. Just be aware of that, please. Um, and I might curse here, and I'm going to try not to, but these guys are incredulous, so it's going to be hard not to. At, at any rate, it blows my mind, I keep going back to this point, that he starts off with, I'm innocent, here's my video of me and my wife acting super weird, but claiming our innocence, and then goes into, you know, these videos he films like in his backyard and wherever else, and uh, promoting Berean publications, which I'm sure they wouldn't like those videos to be up anymore, so we should probably start posting them. I'm sure I have them somewhere. Um, but it's just crazy to me, the acceleration. He doesn't, like, look, let's let's be real. If, if, if you, whether you did the thing or not, and he did the thing, whether you did the thing or not, why are you gonna be so public, man? Like, like it, re really, in a realistic sense, like, why, why? I, I do not comprehend that. Like, if, whether you did it or not, Man, lay low for a minute. That that doesn't. That's not an admission of guilt. That's just being smart. I'm not an attorney, but I feel like an attorney would tell you, "Hey, man, less Bible verse videos, less videos entirely. Like, stop." In fact, if I remember right, and I'll need to research this, so call me out if I'm wrong. But I believe, and I know he's he's written many things about our dear friend Sarah Jackson online that are just just terrible mean and mean is a great word for it because that sums it up but the stuff he's written is just downright gross and in fact uh man i should have had these pulled up so maybe i'll pull them up later on the podcast if i get a, a little break here which i think is coming soon um the he wrote a, a blog uh, you know what i don't think i'll be able to pull it up i think it's gone now but he wrote a blog where you know he says sarah jackson is terrible because because she's an op basically because she is an online health coach. If we're being real, that's what he called her out for. Um, and if you're familiar with whatever it is, Beachbody or any program, uh, you need to show results. So again, not to be crass, that's just what it is. But he was very crass about it. And then he went on to condemn other people that he's counseled because they're coming out against him. And he's like legit blackmailing people on the internet, which is a very unwise thing to do um, if you don't have any proof. It's very unwise because uh, we don't seek to do that here. We seek to tell the truth and tell our, our friends' stories, our friends who happen, happen to be um, victims or who happen to be survivors. We tell their stories. But the stuff that he was saying in this blog is just mind-blowing, like revealing intimate details from counseling because these people are now coming out against him, so he's going to slander them. Like, you know, what's the eye for an eye thing? I guess that's out the window, right? Like, that that's one of Jesus' teachings that just doesn't matter. Um so, anyways, all that to say, uh, it has been incredible to watch the journey. And I haven't watched it closely, but things pop up on my feed from time to time. Watching the journey of Cameron Giovanelli as, as this progresses and as he thinks he's out of the woods and starts, doesn't just, like, he continues posting weird Bible shit. Sorry. And um, he continues posting like whole like entire songs like i don't know where you find um man what is, hymns i can't think man the blue book you know what i'm talking about um songs and songs hymns and spiritual songs i think 
Psalms, hymns, I don't know. The blue one. You guys know what I'm talking about. I think it's a Gaither book. We had it at Howells Anderson. Someone, uh, man, maybe I'll remember it later on. <laughs> I don't know. I should just type in blue hymnal to Google, right? And that would tell me. Um, but he's posting. I don't know where you find entire, like, all of it is well with my soul. I guess you could just Google that too, right? But, like, he's posting tons and tons of uh, scripture verses and uh, lyrics from old ass songs. And the stuff is, to me, again, just from a PR standpoint, is like, man, just chill out. Like, you are not doing anyone, yourself included, any favors by trying to be all high and mighty. This is not a good idea. It's not a good look. I know you think it's a good look, but it's not. So stop. He didn't stop. I mean, I didn't tell him that. But he didn't stop. He continued. And then he accelerated. Um, and I don't have a date on this, so I apologize. But it has been within the year 2019, a few months ago, he started slandering Sarah online. Now, what Sarah's saying is, we believed from the beginning not slander and not libel and not false. But now with an arrest on record, it's definitely not. It's just not. So, um, for him to start throwing things at her and assassinating her character online, which I know is a term that's thrown a lot, around a lot, but like... For him to start doing that, I was like, man, now you're you're stepping up. Do you think you're out of the woods? Do you think you're good? Do you think you're not going to get busted? Like, you must have some kind of knowledge that we don't about your innocence. I don't know. I, it just blew my mind that he escalated. Not only was he doing the super Jesus freak stuff, now he's moving on to, and Sarah's a POS because this and that and this and that. And I was just like... Whoa! Like it, it hurt me to hear it. And Sarah was graceful and kind and generous in her response, but she was also truthful in her response to Cameron on the internet. But man, it just blew my mind that he thought this is acceptable. I'm gonna write this down, or whoever he was working with thought that that was a good idea. And we're back. I uh, added some whiskey here and here, and um, the same shirt though, just to kind of make it feel like it's still me. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, what we left off with, or, and I know you guys are like, why is he acting weird? There's about a week in between these two um, uh, clips that I'm smashing together. Uh, but where we left off is we're talking about the arrogancy of uh, not just Cameron, but also his wife, Sarah Giovanelli, as they're posting these articles slandering uh, our, our good friend Sarah Jackson. And uh, just mind-boggling that someone would think that you know this is not just acceptable, but their duty. You know, um, I, I get it. It's one thing to claim your innocence and uh, whether it's true or not to claim your innocence and say that, you know, I didn't do those things or however you want to phrase it, however you want to word it. Like, I understand that. What I don't understand, and by the way, these articles have been since been deleted, I'm sure via their uh, attorney's advice. But um, it's just crazy to me that they're that they posted those things at all because they're taking it, they're escalating it. They're not just saying, you know, look, my husband's innocent. Look, I'm innocent. I didn't do those things. They're taking it a step beyond and uh, attacking that person online, which I'm sure, not to sympathize with criminals, but I'm sure that on some level they felt like that's what she was doing to them. Whether they bought their own BS or whether that's just how they're trumping everything up, I'm guessing. I, I don't know. I can't see another reason for posting the things that, are, that they have posted. Uh, and again, just terribly mean, awful things. Uh, about Sarah Slanders things, things that, um, you know, I read them and I was just like, like, you know how when you hear something about someone and you're like, man, maybe I should reach out to them, you know, to, to let them know this is being said or to just kind of get some uh, clarity on it. I didn't even need to do that because <laughs> the stuff I was reading was so ridiculous. So uh, ludicrous at best. Since I started filming this, uh, a lot more stuff has, has happened and things that I want to cover are going on. Man, I've got the squeakiest chair ever. I've got to figure a different way to sit here so it doesn't squeak so much for us. So um, we're going to cover three different three different uh, churches and several different people, and we're going to talk about failure to report, uh, which I think is very, very important to be covered because it's, I wouldn't say it's easy, but the spotlight is on people like Cameron Giovanelli and Paul, if I said, I hope I'm saying this right, Paul Laverne Fox is on um, the criminals from Gaylord, Michigan. Um, so the spotlight is on a lot of the criminals, but there are also people that are guilty of not reporting and they're mandated reporters. It's not something where it's like, oh man, I forgot, you know, I was at the store and I meant to grab that, you know, like right now I'm out of, what am I out of? I'm out of dish soap, I think. So 
like if I'm at the store and I forget to grab it, man, that sucks, but it's, you know, it's my problem, right? But these guys want to treat it like that. They want to treat it like, oh, you know what? And, and in fact, in many cases, they don't even want to talk to it at all. Like it didn't exist. It never happened. Like there's police reports, there's arrests, there's, there's, there's victims coming forward. But for them, it's like, oh, it can't be true because Jesus, God, Old Testament, blah, blah, blah. They clearly are just turning a blind eye to it. Uh, no pun intended there. So it's just, it's wild that there are these, not just these criminals that have gotten away with it and no longer are, uh, and not in every case, and we're working to, to make that better for the, for the survivors, for the victims. But there's also a lot of guys and gals who should have reported, and it's not like we're expecting the, them to be detectives, although they should be, uh, and they claim to be vigilant, right? Um, but we're not expecting them to be detectives. We're just expecting them to listen to people when they come to them with accusations about their active staff members instead of taking those accusations, flipping them, and getting those people booted from the church or public, you know, make them have to publicly stand up and you know, say they're wicked awful because of you know, whatever, whatever the reason is um, and get, the, you know, get them excommunicated or at, le at the very least uh, embarrass the hell out of them in front of the congregation, in front of their friends and family and make them look like idiots. Um, or I shouldn't say that at the very least, um, just again, turn a blind eye and not do anything with these predators except allow them to continue their ministry or ship them off to a different ministry where they can prey on someone else. So we are going to talk about that a little bit today. And I think, I don't think that'll be the entire focus of the podcast, but I think it's important for us to all understand and band together and not be timid in letting these people know like, Hey, you know, so-and-so got, you know, Victor got arrested, Paul got arrested, um, you know, Cameron got arrested and, you know, is going back to trial, all that jazz. But you guys are to blame too. Bruce, you're to blame. Jack Trieber, you're to blame. Greg Neal, you're to blame. Tom Neal, you're to blame. Bob Gray Sr., you're to blame. Like, you guys are all to blame because you're turning a blind eye to these criminals even after you've been told that they're criminals. So Black Collar Crime Series, which covers IFP pastors, relies on public news stories and publicly available information for its content. Uh, and it's just kind of a disclaimer at the beginning. In May 2018, Cameron G. Vanelli, the president of Golden State Baptist College, an independent fundamentalist Baptist IFB institution operated by Pastor Jack Treber of North Valley Baptist Church in Santa Clara, California. So I said, what did I say earlier? I don't think I said Santa Clara, but it's Santa Clara. That's where it's at. Uh, was accused of repeatedly sexually assaulting a church teenager when he was a pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in Dundalk, Maryland. And I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that name as well. Juvenile denied the allegations and exited stage right to points unknown. Well, now we know. But uh, today, the Fort Worth Star Telegram reported that Giovanelli is now the associate pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. Giovanelli also plans to help Emmanuel Baptist pastor Greg Neal start a new unaccredited IFB secondary institution called North Florida Baptist College. By the way, that college cannot be allowed to go into existence. I can't. I can't do it alone. But. Uh, this isn't an Area 51 thing either, <laughs> but I can't do it alone. But I think if we all we all work together and are strategic with this and plan things out uh, and, and do the right thing as far as maybe some protests and uh, getting the more information out to more local news media there in Jacksonville, we can keep that from happening. Is that college? I mean, the church, Emmanuel Baptist, isn't bad enough in and of itself, <clears throat> excuse me, that the Neals still have a foothold there in Florida. But for them to um, have even more, which I can't imagine the college is going to do well anyways, but for them to have even more uh, coverage and influence more people, it just can't be allowed to happen. Uh, and I would like to say, especially not after this, but at any rate, it shouldn't be happening. Um, <clears throat> Neil himself was caught up in a sex scandal in 2011. We've covered this before. When he was accused of video voyeurism, Cameron Juvenile was born on June 29th, 1977. He was saved September 20th, 1990. In 1994, he started to preach while attending a youth conference in Santa Clara, California. Following his graduation, he attended Golden State Baptist College, where he met his wife, Sarah, and they graduated in 2000. After graduating from Bible College, Cameron Giovanelli served as a youth pastor for several years in Napa, California, as an associate pastor in Manteca, California, and then as a pastor in the fall of 2003. He pastored a growing church on the East Coast for 11 years before accepting a position. We're aware of that, that church at his alma mater as the president. I believe that was in 2014. We are going to read more uh, a couple of places. I believe it was 2014 that he left um, Dundalk and then went to uh, work for Jack Treber. Um, he, yeah, 
for his own reasons. In 2018, he and his family moved to Jacksonville, Florida, and began serving as an, he began serving as an assistant pastor at the Emmanuel Baptist Church under the leadership of Pastor Greg Neal. Now with the announcement of North Florida Baptist College, Cameron Giovanelli has been asked and has accepted the role of president. Just think about that. 2018, say what you want, figure, you know, work it through your brain how you want, but he was basically let go from uh, North Valley Baptist Church, Golden State Baptist College, because of these accusations. Now he's, as we know, being arrested. But before he was arrested, he was warned by Stacey Shiflett and I'm sure many others, not he was warned, the Neils were warned, hey, this guy's bad news. Maybe don't give him a staff position. Maybe don't put him on your payroll. Maybe don't accept him into your flock. No, no. They not only did that, they said, well, we're also going to start a college because you worked at a college for a long time, so it could be lucrative for us to start a college. We're going to start a college. Again, I wasn't there for this meeting, but I'm assuming. We're going to start a college, and we're going to make you president, just like you were president of the last place that you had to leave because of accusations of sexual misconduct. Guys, like, I get it that you got away the first time, but, like, don't, don't what? <laughs> like, why are you still doing this? Like, I don't know. I mean, part of me is glad they did because obviously, like, it's not going to play out for him like they thought. Clearly, now it's not. He's been removed from the, the website. He's no longer showing up as an administrator there. Are they going to continue to harbor and help him? Most likely, but they're not going to do it in the public eye. Are they going to keep it as hush hush as they can? So it's just wild to me. Wild, wild, wild. And I've said that a lot, but this everything we're going to cover today is wild to me. It's just wild to me that they thought, well, let's just try this out. Like, no, don't try it out at all. Leave it alone. Like, you are, you're putting your hand in the frying pan. Are you kidding me? Anyways. Cameron and Sarah Giovanelli have three children. Together, the Giovanelli family has seen the Lord work in remarkable ways. Cameron Giovanelli is a seasoned servant and a soldier of the cross. <laughs> it's about to be. And it is with great excitement that North Florida Baptist College has called him, was from their website, to lead the way of training up the next generation of church leaders and you will no longer find that blurb on the website i went to uh i think it's called solving church problems that's bob gray's website yeah it's solving church problems um and he didn't really have anything that kind of spoke to this but on um and i didn't find anything on alan donnelly's website which is old path i didn't find anything on his website that really directly um spoke to this but alan but i could have missed it because alan donnelly publishes stuff every day on his website so i could have easily missed it he did have one about uh marriage and and and, and uh, being chased in your marriage and making sure that you're not friends with other couples because that's how you know group sex orgies happen i don't know if you guys knew this but that's what alan dom maybe it happened to him i don't know so anyways it, it wasn't really clear but um when it comes to what's going on at wildemar faith Baptist church bruce goddard there is and and bruce posts probably two three times a week on his blog won't say anything about you know what's going on at his church and accusations and the church getting raided and, and a ton of police he won't talk about that but he will uh condemn social media on his blog so we will read that so look forward to that as i am looking forward to it um and you can read it yourself um it's on faith baptist church's uh website and um i'll tell you where to look for that when we get to it baltimore county police this is on baltimoresun.com and there are tons of articles now Literally just Google Cameron Giovanelli, G-I-O-V-A-N-E-L-L-I, and you'll find tons of articles on what's going on. So if you miss something here or if you're confused on something, feel free to PM us or, or myself. Um, but there's there's tons and tons of information on it right now, what's going on. August 30th is the date to remember, and I will explain why in a moment. Baltimore County Police have arrested a former pastor of a fundamentalist Baptist church we got to get them to say that right. Fundamental, independent, fundamental Baptist church. Because the IFB would be mad about that, right? Actually, they probably want them to get that wrong. Um, in Dundalk, on charges, he sexually abused a teenager on the church's grounds and elsewhere in the Baltimore area um, more than 10 years ago. Cameron Shane Giovanelli, 42, of Orange Park, Florida, was pastor of Calvary Baptist Church from 2004 to 2014. I did remember. So in 2014... Or sometime around there, he left uh, Calvary and went over to work for North Valley Baptist Church, Golden State Baptist College, Jack Treber. Now, to say that Jack knew the moment he stepped on campus or when he candidated and when he decided to move that this stuff was going on, I can't say that. But there's no way with, and someone can correct me if, if I'm wrong, but there's no way that with 
Cameron being a president of the college, and at least on a few occasions, I don't know if he did whole tours, but taking tour groups of young people, including ladies, um, young ladies, out to, you know, to, to, to sing at churches. But these are, again, uh, young adults, um, you know, was 18 to 20, 24 probably, um, right in that age range. Like, he's taking these girls. Of course, he had his wife with him, but it, that doesn't, we've seen the video of her, that doesn't matter. Um, and we've seen, and many of us have seen her, you know, declaration of how wicked Sarah is. But you can't tell me that Jack Treber either wasn't told what was going on or didn't have, you know, just an inkling, that spidey sense. What do they call it? I can't remember what they call it in the new, new one. It's kind of funky the way they phrase it. But it's, there's just, no, I'm sorry. This is something I've said before on the podcast. There's just no way that you don't know what's going on, man. It's just not possible. And again, we are going to get into mandated reporters uh, and it's very important that we talk about that because that's something that these, you know, these guys are going to jail, we're going to court, you know, trials, hearings, and so on. But we can't leave out the fact that there were those. You got to go down with a ship, man. If you're the pastor of this church and you're ignoring these, not just signs, but if you're ignoring people coming to you telling you, hey, there's something really wrong with this guy, and this is exactly what it is, and you're like, Oh uh, no, they just pray more and, and like no, like no, no, no. Or you know, send them to this church and it'd be fine. Like, no, it's not fine. Like you can't do that. These are real human beings um that are being assaulted by other human beings and you're just letting the the perpetrators walk. You're paying them. It's ridiculous. All right. Um authorities charged him with sexual abuse of a minor. Again, please remember that this episode I'm gonna Try to keep it as far as my cursing goes, somewhat PG, PG thirteen, less than R. Um, but the details are very gruesome. Okay, so take that you know as you will. Authorities charged him with sexual abuse of a minor, perverted practice, and a fourth degree sexual offense involving the girl who was part of the congregation. The incidents, the incidents allegedly occurred in two thousand and seven. Police said Thursday they believe there were more victims. There, there, there may be other victims and encourage them to come forward. And there's a phone number here to call, and we will list that as well. But uh, it's never just one. It's just not. That's not how these guys work. And that's not to take anything away from anyone or or say anything unkind about or to anyone that's that's a survivor here. But it's never just one. There's always more than one. Especially, especially when the incidents occurred at this place and then in 2014 he left that place so he's had five more years to do his thing which is pedophilia so sorry it just doesn't work that way you don't you don't get away with something like that and then abscond to two different places within the next five years and not do it again it's just it does not work that way and this isn't this isn't my you know this isn't my thing to say or do so this isn't my call um you know, to, to any victims, any survivors to come out, you know, that's, that's for you to do, you to decide what the right time is for you, um, when you're, and, and whether, whether it's be victim of Cameron or of, you're a victim of someone else, um, I actually had, a, a friend here on, on social media, a good friend of mine, uh, actually, I think did a post about this and said, you know, I, I confronted my abuser, it didn't go my way, but I'm, I'm on track now, that gave me while it didn't give me the closure I was looking for, and I'm paraphrasing, and she knows who she is, uh, while it didn't give me the closure I was looking for, it, you know, I got to say the things and do the things, and, uh, you know, statute of limitations, I think it was prevented uh, justice from being served as it should have been, but at least I got to get out there and make my statement and say my thing, and I'm not, I am not saying that I can, um, I do my best to empathize, but I can't fully understand the scope of what, you know, you've gone through, so I'm not saying, like, Oh, well, it's no big deal. You should just, you know, out your abuser and everything will be hunky-dory. No, no, no. That's literally the opposite of what I'm saying. What I'm saying is take your time, do what feels right to you, but understand that uh, that those who've been abused, whether they get the restitution and the justice that they deserve, at least they got to say their piece. And at least they got to, um, not got to be a part of the movement, but they, they got to, in their hearts, know that they told the truth and that they, they did everything they could to bring that person to justice. And, and I'm not saying that that's enough, because it certainly is not. But in some cases, that's how it goes, and at least you got to say your piece. That's all I'll say on that. From the bottom of my heart, please understand that I'm not saying that that makes life insanely better or everything's hunky-dory once that happens. I'm just relaying that information to you, 
and letting you know, hey, if you're a victim of cameras or someone else's, when the time is right and when you feel like you're ready to, to come forward and make your statement, please do it. You, you, owe it. you owe it to yourself. That's all I'll say on that. Okay. A warrant for Juvenile's arrest was issued Monday. Again, this was written on August 6th, August 8th. Um, and he traveled Tuesday to Maryland to turn himself in to county police under an agreement made through his attorney, County State's Attorney Scott Schellenberger said. Juvenile was released on his own recognizance. That was written August 8th. So Monday, Tuesday is going to be a warrant for Juvenile's arrest was issued Monday. That's going to be Monday the 5th. And he traveled Tuesday to Maryland to turn himself into county police uh, and so on. Uh, so Tuesday would be the 6th. So the 5th and the 6th are the dates that kind of stick out there. The warrant was issued. I think it said the warrant, warrant was issued on Monday the 5th. And then on the 6th was when um, he uh, he turned himself in. A release on your own recognizance, because I've, I've heard it said a time or two, but I'd like to clarify it here. Personal recognizance is a written promise signed by the defendant promising that they will show up for future court appearances and not engage in illegal activity while out on an ROR release on own recognizance. So basically, you know, you pay the bail money because this is America, we need our money, right? You pay the bail money and then you say, okay, sorry, I know I effed up, I won't do it again in the next however long it is until I gotta come back and I will be back on the assigned date um, for my, you know, trial. And hopefully they'll pull an Epstein in the meantime. I don't know. I, I, Everyone's got their own opinions, and they're not all going to be the same as mine. I just feel like this is a, this is a Jerry, Jerry, not to make fun, but there's a Jerry Seinfeld bit about, you know, the wanted posters, and it's, it's got a picture of the guy on the wanted poster, like, I'm at the post office, you know, back in the day, and I see a wanted poster, the guy's picture is right there, like, when you took the picture, why didn't you just grab him? He's right there. <laughs> like, that's how I feel. Like, you had him, and then you were like, now pay us some money, and you can go hang out at home for a while. Like, no, no. I know that's not how this system works, but man, just leave him there. He needs to stay there. So uh, that's what release on over cognizance means. So back to the readings. Um, excuse me. Juvenile's accuser, Sarah Jackson, has publicly described several times what she called sexual abuse by the pastor when she was 16, a member of Calvary Baptist, the granddaughter of an associate pastor, and a babysitter of Juvenile's children. The Baltimore Sun does not typically identify people who say they are sex abuse victims, but Jackson gave permission for her name to be used. The 29-year-old uh, Harford County resident first made her accusation in May of 2018 in a Facebook post and repeated them in a personal blog uh, and YouTube videos and as a guest in June on a podcast called Not Your Mother's Podcast. So thank you, um, Baltimore Sun, and thank you, Sarah, uh, more importantly, for being brave and speaking uh, about what had happened to you. Giovanna cannot be reached for comment, of course. On Tuesday night, Jackson tweeted her reaction. I've cried, I've prayed, I've watched my character, integrity, and my family being shredded for speaking up. She wrote, today God's timing was revealed. Today Cameron Giovanelli was arrested for sexually abusing me in high school. Jackson said Wednesday that she preferred not to comment further. Don't blame me, Sarah. Giovanelli has denied the allegations, of course, including a 2,400-word posting that appeared on his website in June, again, taken down since. According to the Fort, I believe, according to the Fort Wayne, uh, Fort, sorry, Fort Wayne, I got Indiana stuck in my head. Would you know it? Is it right here? Um, according to the Fort Worth Star Telegram, which ran an investigative series in December, that section was counted by preachers in the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church. That is a loose affiliation of conservative <laughs> congregations within the Baptist tradition. Jackson, oh, here we go, is a liar, and her day of dragging my name through the mud is done, he wrote in the statement, according to the Star Telegram article. For over one year, I've allowed her to smear my name, seek to destroy my reputation, and harass my family through social media. I'm glad we have these uh, to hang on to. This is very important. Because again, this is, yeah, and there it says the statement is no longer available on Giovanelli's website. Again, the attorney told him to take it down. Excuse me, gotta save face. It's the right thing to do. Not the right thing to do. There's no right thing anymore, but that's, that's what his attorney's telling him to do. Giovanelli left Calvary Baptist in 2014 to accept the position of president at his alma mater, Golden State Baptist College in Santa Clara, California, according to his successor at the church, the Reverend Stacy Shiplett. Calvary Baptist has a membership of about 350 people. It's a solid congregation, said Shiplett, who Giovanelli supported as his replacement five years ago. When reports of the alleged abuse reached Shiplett in May 2018, he said he called Jackson and asked whether the allegations were true. Shiplett said Jackson described what happened in a lengthy conference call with Shiplett and church deacons as Jackson's husband, Thomas Jackson, a Harford Sheriff's deputy, listened. 
Shifflett said that the story was so detailed that he and the other church leaders decided to investigate further. He said he quickly found numerous witnesses who corroborated many elements of Jackson's story and other evidence supported it as well. There were a lot of things she said that I knew she shouldn't, she couldn't be making up, Shifflett said. Jackson posted her account of the alleged abuse on Facebook and shortly after, the allegation went viral. Giovanelli, a married father of three, left his position at the California school to accept an associate pastor's position at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida, which they quickly repurposed into president of our new fake Jesus college. Shiflett said one reason he took Jackson's allegations seriously is that he was twice the victim of sexual misconduct as a teen. He said he was molested by a Bible college student who later went to prison on sexual abuse charges, and he was later groomed and propositioned by a widely respected pastor in the South. In the first case, Shiflett said church authorities had ignored several earlier warnings about the perpetrator, they always do, in the IFB. In the second, Shiflett said he reported the misconduct to authorities only to have to look on as the pastor was later granted a prominent position as, at a Christian school in another state. Again, shuffling. They're always shuffling. Um, Shifflett said he kept his parishioners apprised of developments in the Jackson case and congregants have been supportive. And that is, as I've seen on social media, that is the case. If convicted, Giovanelli faces up to 25 years, that's it, in prison, on the charge of sexual abuse of a minor, 10 years on the perverted practice charge, and one year on the fourth degree sex offense charge. Giovanelli recently announced plans to open and serve as president of the North Florida Baptist College, NBC for me, I think it was, right? Uh, starting uh, in 2020, as of Wednesday, his name was not listed on the school's website. A preliminary hearing on the case is scheduled for August 30th, I told you to remember that date, August 30th, in County District Court in Towson. Police are asking anyone who may have been victimized by Giovanelli or anyone with information on the case to call this number, 410-853-3650. Again, police are asking anyone who may have been victimized by Giovanelli or anyone with information on the case to call 410-853-3650. Please do. Um, so, there's that. That's the... That's the latest, as, as I understand it, and there may be more, more things on social media that I haven't um, been apprised of and maybe not, I'm just not aware of uh, in regards to this case. Um, but as of now, that's what we have. Cameron Giovanelli was arrested, turned himself in, was ROR, released on his own recognizance. I think that's the way you pronounce that word. Got, him, got himself out on bail. And will is due now back in court on August 30th. Um, and that has retained an attorney. I had that information pull up earlier. Uh, if you're curious who that attorney is, let me know and I'll get you their information. Their website is crap. Just saying. Again, I'm looking at, of course, Cameron Giovanelli, like he's, what is it? Do the crime to your time? Like it's happening. Like that's the big thing for so many of us is, man, it's, it's happening. Like this, like we always believed it. And we always, you know, we knew in our hearts. And I'm not trying to make myself a part of something that I shouldn't be. I'm just trying to help. And um, I do consider the podcast to be uh, something that has helped a few people um, just because they've reached out to me to tell me so. But <clears throat> we are, we're, the, the, it's happening. It's finally happening. It, and, and it's not to say we didn't think it would happen, but it was a lot of hope going into this. It was a lot of you know, a lot of prayer from a lot of people. That that I'm sure of. And we, you know, I may have an opinion of prayer or not, but man, it, it's finally happening. So for it to finally be happening, for this man to finally have been, you know, taken, you know, taken into custody, turning himself in, for things to finally be going the way they're supposed to be going, at least on some level, man, for me, it's a feeling of relief. And I understand for survivors and victims as well, it's not, not so much relief as it is, okay, we, you know, here it is, but we've got a lot of work to do. We're going to have to sit through a lot of, a lot of court. We're going to have to go through a lot of, you know, BS. A lot more stuff is going to have to bring up. A lot of triggering is going to have to happen throughout this process. And I don't use that word lightly. I know that it is often, and I probably have used it lightly myself. But that's what's going to happen. You know, that's how it's going to go for the next few months. You know, next year, however long it's going to be. Uh, hopefully, not that long. But, but again, it's finally happening. And man, like I know, maybe I look a little too excited. It could be the whiskey a little bit, the bourbon a little bit. Um, but I'm thrilled that this has finally come to fruition. 
So again, we got more to look at. Um, this is not the only thing that we're covering, and we'll come back to Giovanelli here in a moment. But I just want to share that with you guys. That's kind of the rundown, the details. Um, I've been <laughs> myself and the podcast. I've been tagged a few times, and on, on recent posts, I've been like, "Hey, when are you going to talk about this?" Okay, we're talking about it uh, because it's very important, very needed, a very important conversation. Um, right now for us to be having. That's what's going on with Cameron Juvenelli, with Sarah Jackson, uh, with that case. So um, August 30th, he's back in court. Uh, we wait with bated breath to see how this goes, to see what the judge says, to see how things will proceed, um, to see, you know, if there, I don't know the details. If there's a jury, if, you know, what, what more evidence is brought forward, if more victims come forward, if more survivors come forward. We're, we're all, we're all, well, I shouldn't say we're all, I'm waiting with bated breath uh, to see what happens. So very excited um, to see justice uh, because this is the beginning of justice being brought um, to Sarah's doorstep. And a website called myvalleynews.com. Uh, we live here, I, I don't live far from Wildemar. This is called the Inland Empire. And uh, Empire, I don't know why, because it doesn't feel like one, although I pay Empire type prices for cost of living, gas, and so on. We're playing with $4 right now. So, um, uh, but this is the Inland Empire, and this is definitely a, a valley that we live in. And so that's what uh, this, this newspaper and uh, this website is called, uh, Valley News. <clears throat> and I commend the author, you know, find him, Jeff Pack, because he is doing a deep dive on Faith Baptist Church, on Bruce Goddard, on everything that has transpired there, and how it, I would like to say how it was handled, but really how it wasn't handled at all. So um, we're going to dive into this a little bit, because there has been another arrest uh, of another youth pastor from Faith Baptist Church under that that was under Bruce Goddard uh, again because as far as I know Bruce is the founder I remember having to read man if anyone can remember his book he had a book that I had to read as part of a curriculum at Hiles Anderson I think it was something about a walk with God closer walk with God something like that um, but um, I didn't read it <laughs> I read some of it uh, but I didn't read the whole thing I, I think the only one excuse me that I think I fully read was The Fundamental Man uh, about Jack Hiles, but I read it in high school, so I kind of counted it in college in Daryl Whitehouse's class. Sorry, Daryl, um, <laughs> that I read it. Not really sorry, uh, because I read it in high school like a year before. I remember falling asleep. Uh, we were living in a trailer. I was in the top bunk. Uh, Andrew, my brother, I uh, love you, was in the bottom bunk, and uh, I remember falling asleep one night, one school night, uh, reading The Fundamental Man because I had chosen it for a book report. Sorry, Cindy Scott, but it was just super, well, not Scott anymore. And Cindy, oh, Cindy Hiles. Uh, <laughs> uh, not any better, honestly. Um, but uh, sorry, Cindy, it was boring as could be. I mean, what did you expect? I don't think he really was an army ranger, but whatever. Okay, so, or a paratrooper, paratrooper. I'm sorry. Okay, so, this article was last updated on August 9th, 2019. Uh, and so I'm just going to read to you a little bit about this. I am going to be a very, I do my best to be delicate uh, with who and what I mention. Um, but it is important that these things, for me, for this episode of Not Your Mother's Podcast, it's, it's important, if I'm using the right word here, for these things to kind of conglomerate, come together, uh, for us to all think about the fact that there's so many similarities in these cases, but also talk about failure to report, how important that is, and the, the role that it plays here. And the fact that people ignoring people are ignoring failure to report, that's a huge problem. We're going to talk about that. But the fact that they're ignoring it has caused more crimes to be committed. Because not just failure to report, it's more like refusal to report. Failure to report is a technical, you know, law, civil law term. But refusal to report is what's resulted in more victims and uh, more crimes and people perpetrating more and more crimes because they were allowed to. And whether it was in the same place or a different place, they continued doing what they were doing because why? I'm not getting in any trouble and this is what I want to do, so I'm gonna do it. So we're gonna look at we're gonna look at failure to report, who and what is a mandated reporter, how that happens. But first we're gonna look at uh, Valley My Valley News and this article about uh, Faith Baptist Church. In the wake of a second recent occurrence of an arrest involving a youth, sorry, youth pastor accused of sexually molesting teenage girls at Faith Baptist Church. Victims and critics of the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church in Wildemar. Okay, I gotta stop reading so well here. <laughs> it's not working out, is it? I just realized I'm going like this to read. You guys are seeing all of my bald spot probably for my white hair. I've got a little streak up in here. All right, so in the wake of a second recent occurrence of an arrest involving a youth pastor accused of sexually molesting teenage girls at Faith Baptist Church, victims and critics of Baptist of 
the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church of Wildemar are coming forward to talk about the culture and practices they say are dangerous. Late last week, Laverne Paul Fox, 60 years old, was extradited from his home in Erie, Pennsylvania, and charged with molesting a girl nearly 30 years ago while serving as a youth pastor. Fox has been slated to be arraigned on charges of lewd acts on a child, oral copulation of a minor, and forced sexual penetration of a child under 16 years old, but he posted bail at the Robert Presley Jail in Riverside Tuesday, August 1st. He will next appear in court at his arraignment October 2nd, oh damn it, that's my birthday, at the Southwest Justice Center in Marietta. I should probably go um, because it is 15 minutes from here. Um, according to Riverside County Sheriff Department, Sergeant Glenn Warrington from Lake Elsinore Station, detectives became aware of Fox's alleged offenses while conducting a separate investigation into the sexual abuse of, of teenage girls by another youth pastor, 46-year-old Malo Victor Montero of Colton. Montero, who committed the crimes uh, while employed by the Faith Baptist Church of Wildemar, pled guilty last November to seven sex-related felonies and was sentenced to five years and four months in state prison. Though the two were accused of similar crimes, there is no indication that Montero and Fox were acquainted. But, according to multiple sources, including online posts by Fox's victim, Montero was intimately aware that Fox was alleged to have committed crimes against the woman as he was married to the alleged victim's sister, which again, I think we've covered before. But again, you've got to look at the track record of Bruce Goddard. That is wild, man. This happened twice? And, and, and not just twice. It was the same exact church position. These men, these men were criminals, pedophiles. And, and in both instances... You pawn them off on a different church. But but Bruce isn't to blame. We'll read his blog in a minute. Bruce is not to blame. It's not his fault that he didn't report these things. Following the publishing of Fox's arrest, the Valley News made several attempts to reach church officials for comment, but have yet to receive a response. They're not going to. The Valley News also reached out to people currently or formerly associated with the church, as well as, victors, uh, as, well as Montero's victims, to talk about what happened to them. And there's a more recent article, if you look at myvalleynews, I think it's .com, MyValleyNews.com is a more recent article um, that, that, that bears uh, covering, and, and there's a lot of information there from uh, some very great sources, um, some people that are very close to and have been abused by um, you know, staff members at Faith Baptist Church, and it's definitely worth a read, a more recent article than the one posted on August 9th. Several victims and other church members responded, and some pointed out uh, to other former Faith Baptist Church or Faith Baptist Academy staff members who were arrested for sex-related crimes during their time at the church or since moving. The story is the first in a series by the Valley News asking questions about whether Faith Baptist Church, the Associated Faith Baptist Academy, and founding church leader Bruce Goddard, yes, he did found it, that's what I thought, have fostered a culture that is dangerous in the community. Absolutely. So what is Faith Baptist Church? According to the Faith Baptist Church website, the church was founded in 1982 by Goddard and his wife Tammy, and it currently sits within two miles of Elsinore High, yes, on the backside of Elsinore High School, on Walnut Street in Wildemar. The sprawling complex has buses, a multitude of buildings on the property, and an athletic field on the corner of Walnut and Mission Trail Drive. If you live, you know, in or around Wildemar, Marietta, Temecula, you've been past it, you've seen it, there's no way you haven't. There's a big football field out front. The church promotes service times at 9 a.m. for Sunday school, a morning service at 10.30 a.m., and an evening service at 6.30 on Sundays, to which I have been, I've been to all of them. Um, there is also Wednesday evening service at 7 p.m. Didn't go to that one so much. In addition to the church, Faith Baptist Academy, an unaccredited private school, again, so many of us, when you, when you look back, when you think about it, a lot of us that went to Christian school, we need a GED still. Technically, we need a GED because our schooling was unaccredited. Not just college, duh, <laughs> but even high school was unaccredited. I've got two diplomas that are shit. Like, they're nothing. They're pieces of paper. They don't hold any water anywhere. Anyways, there's that. According to the school's website, the academy was founded by concerned and loving parents who realized their children were spending over 30 hours a week in an environment contrary to the beliefs of their families in their church. And if you think that is not how they, not they, if you think that's not how Bruce feels, just literally go to any service at Faith Baptist Church and you'll hear him preach against the public school every time. Like he was doing it on Sunday mornings. Like, I mean, a lot of people watching this podcast are familiar with the church culture of the IFB. Like, Sunday mornings, you preach a nice, fluffy sermon, okay? You, you go Joel Osteen 
on Sunday mornings. You don't go, Wednesday nights is when you really get into the nitty gritty and you call people out and you yell at people for low attendance and you talk about the fact that you don't like this public school. Bruce Goddard hates the public school so much, he can't keep himself from preaching against it on a Sunday morning. So we're reading through this article about Bruce Goddard and Faith Baptist Church, of which I technically, I don't think I was a member, but I definitely joined the church uh, when I moved out here in 2000 and something, 2011, because I started working uh, in Michigan in 2009. So the Valley News will continue to investigate the cases involving the victims of Victor Montero and the alleged victim of Fox. In future stories, oh, here I go again, right? <laughs> <clears throat> we will take a look at the so-called Mother Church. Oh boy, I can't wait for this. Um, First Baptist Church in Hammond, Indiana, founded by Jack Hiles as a Baptist church as well as Faith Baptist Church and Wildemar Sides to Hiles Anderson College. According to a 2018 report by the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, there have been at least 412 allegations of sexual misconduct in 187 independent fundamental Baptist churches and their affiliated institutions spanning 40 states in Canada, which surprises me. Uh, just must not have looked internationally. Look, here's the deal. There, and I read another thing in this article. I'll try to show that later on. But there are at least at least three different staff members that were either convicted or accused of sexual misconduct with a minor as they were adults while serving at Faith Baptist Church under Bruce Goddard. I think that's, there's so much more to know, but I think that's all you need to know is that that's what's going on. And let me tell you, Bruce's response to these things is mind blowing. So we're going to actually go over Bruce's response first, and then we're going to talk about Gaylord and um, John Jenkins and all that fun stuff out in Michigan. Um, we'll cover it lightly. I, each one of these things I'm covering today needs its own episode, if, if we're being honest. Um, but I do want to cover them just briefly because I've, um, I've been seeing what's going on. I have had a few people reach out to me and say, Hey, you know, what's going on and, uh, or can you speak on it? Not me specifically, but just kind of the podcast. Let's, let's all sit down and talk about it. Uh, my, I don't think my opinion matters. I really don't. Um, but I do want the podcast to be speaking on these things and I want us to engage in active conversations around what's going on and who's getting indicted and who is a real POS, um, Bruce Goddard being one of them. So uh, I want to read. So Bruce, here's the thing. I don't go to that church. <laughs> There's no way I'd be let on the property. I do know a few people who have close ties to that church. So um, they are incredibly helpful in keeping us up to date here and informed on what's going on. Uh, and But as far as like what he's going to say on Sunday morning and what's going on in the ministries, we I don't really know, uh, fully know all of that. But I do know that it's the same old Bruce. And uh, he is the best ostrich impersonator I have ever met and shook in hand, shook in hands with, shook hands with, and have been counseled by, uh, and uh, all that jazz. So much fun. Um, but yeah, I don't know what this, Bruce is just something else. I don't know. It's not funny. I don't know why I'm laughing. I think that's all I have left to do at this point. Just, he is just ridiculous. So what happens is, okay, here's what happens. Here's what I was going with that. Bruce will not, as far as I know, respond so much in a message. Um, the guy gets up to speak in front of his church staff multiple times throughout the week, in front of his church members at least three times a week, right? Um, definitely more, but at least three times a week. Um, there's Sunday school and other special classes throughout the week, and there's chapel at, at, at school, and those are all church members at school. So he gets up multiple times a week to speak, and as far as I know, rarely, if ever, touches on accusations and all these guys that are getting, you know, locked up for sexual, terrible sexual crimes. He's not going to talk about it because he is guilty of failure to report. He is a mandated reporter. He was brought, it wasn't, here's the thing. Here's what, as far as I can tell, here's what Bruce wants you to think. Oh my, oh my God, Th that happened. That man did that thing. I'm shocked. What is a Claude Rains uh, line from, uh, Cosmobunk. I'm shocked, shocked to find that gambling is going on in here. Like that's what we're dealing. That's really like I don't know if anyone gets that reference. I don't know if my if my siblings will watch this episode or not. Andrew might, but um, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with someone who knows every intricate, intimate detail of what's going on, and instead of standing up for those who've been wrong, instead of trying to help and trying to be 
a shepherd to their flock, he's just uh, no. I don't think I don't think that really happened. Or let me shuffle you off to the officers. Let me let me yank the border patrol agent out of bed and have him show up in all his regalia and weaponry and make it look like it's all official to scare the shit out of you. So you throw all your stuff in a U-Haul and head to Hammond, Indiana, where they harbor you know lots of pedophiles. That's what we're dealing with. That's what Bruce really does. Six, and then when stuff comes up and people get arrested and uh, accusations are brought forth, what does he do? <laughs> he sticks his head in the sand. The guy has nothing to say. And to be fair, like I don't know what he would say. You know, <laughs> that would there's nothing that could recuse him. Nothing that could make him sound like the good guy here. So I, I get it to an extent, but you can't have a public platform and be like, let's, let's make this realistic. An NBA star is accused of something like this, right? An NFL star is accused of something like this. Not, let, let's take it a step further. They're not just accused. They're convicted and sent to, to jail. Do you think the Falcons didn't say anything about Michael Vick? I know I'm getting a little bit heavy on the NFL here. Do you think the Falcons said nothing about Michael Vick? But their front office had to make a statement about him when he got in trouble for letting dogs eat each other alive with dog fights. They had to. Like, your PR people, your press people, your front office, they got to talk about this stuff because they're going to get in trouble if they don't. And they're going to get fried on social media and by the news media if they don't talk about it. And it's not to say, like, oh, Michael Vick's innocent or whatever. It's not to paint their staff members who are now in prison in a good light. It's just to say, here's our public statement about this thing. But Bruce 100% refuses to make public statements about these accusations. Not just accusations. People getting arrested, locked up, churches being raided, his, his premises being raided. Like, all that stuff, not going to talk about it. But he does have a blog. And he does have undertones in his blog that talk about social media, and talk about righteousness, and talk about sin, and talk about how some people shouldn't be guilty of sin. And we're going to read that in just a moment. But this is where you get your taste of how Bruce Goddard really feels. The man who, under his leadership, under his tutelage, under his cult umbrella, over which he has absolute power. That's how cults work. You got one leader. He has absolute power. I'm not talking about Jack Howes or Jack Scott. I'm not talking about the Mecca and Hammond. I'm talking about the local IFB church, independent, fundamental Baptist church. Your pastor, it's do or die. He's the one and only. And Bruce has absolute autonomy and absolute power over the members, over the staff members, and um, over everyone from the bus kids, which is I understand could be a derogatory term. I don't intend it to be so. From the bus kids to the assistant pastor, he's the boss. And these guys love to preach everything rises and falls on leadership until one of their <laughs> assistants one of their school teachers, something like that, is accused of something so egregious. All right, so let's get to that. So that's the article from My Valley News. Again, props, mad, mad props to Jeff Pack, who did an incredible job so far, and I'm sure he will continue to do so, of covering Faith Baptist Church in Wilmar and what actually has happened, what actually has transpired there, and what's going to continue going on there. I, I am so excited to read the upcoming articles from uh, Jeff. That, that was terrific. So I scrolled through, uh, I went over to Faith Baptist. So if you go to Faith Baptist's website and um, you go to the homepage, uh, I just want to kind of walk you guys through this. If you go to ministries, so you go to fbcwildemar.org. So if you guys want some uh, entertaining uh, reading material, if you go to fbcwildemar.org, so fbcwildomar.org, and you hover over ministries or click on ministries, you're going to see ministries, adult classes, conferences, eternity. I should read all of these. I should take an episode and just read the whole damn site. That'd be so much fun. Anyways, if you look, if you hover over ministries to the right, you'll see Pastor Goddard's blog. So I'm going to click on that for us. Pastor Goddard's blog. And here's the thing. I read through the last. So this article was published on the 9th. There have been other articles. There have been other things going on, other news that's breaking. But... I wanted to see if there was any kind of you know follow up from Bruce on what's happening, what's going on, people that are being arrested, his former staff members that keep getting locked up for you know being pedophiles. I wanted to see if he talked about that at all. And you're not going to find a blog from Bruce that's like, look, 
these guys were pedophiles. My bad. I'm really sorry. I'm going to resign. You're not going to find an article that says, hey, these guys weren't actually pedophiles and, 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 and you shouldn't, you should be nice to them. Like you're not going to find those articles, but you are going to find them. And he writes his blog, guys, he writes this, I almost said dude, <laughs> guys, he writes this blog consistently on a weekly basis, a couple updates a week at least. Okay. So these are, this is the public. Again, I'm the public. Okay. Because I wouldn't be allowed on that campus. It's just, I wouldn't. Someone can hit me up tomorrow and tell me you're allowed. I'm not going. <laughs> I've driven around it. I've driven through the parking lot. I saw Mikey Payne the other day. Uh, we featured him in a video. Cool rugby striped shirt. If you scroll back a few, you'll see it. Um, but I'm the public. Okay. And so this is how I consume what Bruce has to say about the members of his former staff that have been convicted that are locked up and so on. So if you scroll down, study is the first one. And again, there may be another one tomorrow. I don't know. It is Sunday. It's a good time for him to be posting. I found it. It's the most, <laughs> it's the most recent one. And it's study on, um, and he likes to have those one word titles. I get it. Rappers do it too with their, with their uh, songs. It's a good call. Um, 8.16. Today is the, se oh, yesterday. Woo! Okay. Study. Good morning. As a young Christian, this is written by Bruce Goddard. I mean, days after being saved, I began to read and study my Bible. Good job, Bruce. While only 18 years old and having only been in church a couple of times in my life, I began reading much scripture every day. After a while, I'm... Let's be fair. I've had a little bit of this to drink, as you can see. It's going to be difficult for me not to mock the phrasing and everything about this. I'm going to try not to. I'm just going to try to read it to you. But I'm going to tell you right now, it's it's going to happen. Okay, so, so be prepared. Um... After a while, the Bible became my constant companion, and I would read several hours a day. All right, Ray Young. I was, there I go. <laughs> One more sentence. I was assaulted, and I don't know why he used that word. I think, and to be fair, I think Bruce used the wrong word here. I was assaulted early on by someone who said they believed the New Testament, but not the Old. And this is very interesting because if you've read the Bible, or if you're familiar, and a lot of you are, Old Testament is... That is, whether you believe, and I'm not saying like you should or shouldn't believe the Bible. Like, let's throw that. Let, can we can we table that for a moment? I'm not going on that rant right now. I've done it before. I'll do it again. I'm just saying, Old and New Testament, as I understand it and as I've read it, New Testament is a, is a lot of the teachings of Jesus Himself, which is the Son of God, and a whole lot of uh, forgiveness and love. And hey, let me rewrite that crazy stuff. You know that Moses penned because that nothing I'm not mad at it but like we don't need it anymore you know you're, the law you know is not out the window but it ain't what it used to be that's kind of the vibe I get from Jesus he didn't say ain't but you know what I mean so we're, he's going to talk about the rec, kind of reconciling the Old and New Testament which is very interesting to me because the Old Testament is crazy whether you whether you've read it or not like if, if you're a child like I've we have a, a five, almost six year old, six years old today, actually on the 17th. Happy birthday, Chloe. Um, she's, uh, she, on, on, as of tomorrow, she'll be six or today when I'm posting this, she'll be six. But like the rule in the old Testament was when she talked back to you, which she does every day, cause she's independent and she's her own person. When, when your child talks back to you, you take them outside the city and you take big rocks and you smash them on the child until the child dies. That's the old Testament. That's the Old Testament, okay? So this guy's trying, where he's going to go with this is, you got to believe the new and the old Testament. I'm not saying I don't believe it, that it didn't happen, but like the rules and the regulations and the laws, man, that shit is wild. And Jesus came and was like, no, 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 let's, let's not like kill children because they didn't say the right thing. Let's have a little empathy here. If I could say anything about the teachings of Jesus, uh, true or not, whether he was real or not, and I'm not saying he was or he wasn't, but like, and here I go. If I could say anything about those teachings, I would say it feels like the guy had a decent amount of empathy, except for the money changers in the temple, which is still one of my favorite stories of all time. Anyways, here we go. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was assaulted early on by someone who said they believed the New Testament, but not the old. I went to my room and several hours later, without a concordance or computer, recorded dozens of places in the New Testament that quoted the Old Testament. Well, no shit. If you believe one, you must believe the other. And again, no one's saying they don't believe it. This is the Old Testament is wild. The young man, a master's student, surrendered to me 
Good job, Bruce. Way to make him surrender. Surrender to me. A first semester. Again, this guy is just stroking it. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not a nice thing to say. But, like, really, like, I was a freshman and he was a master's student and I showed him what was what. Who, who cares, dude? That was, like, what, 30 years ago? How old are you? Anyway. In a secular college and said that, yes, he did believe the Old Testament, too. Well, duh, he believed it. Recently, I heard someone say they needed answers. Again, he puts that in quotations, Mark. That's why I did that as well. For nearly four decades, I have stood three or more times a week and documented what the Bible says and taught the why, all caps, of our faith. Again, he. this is an undertone, but he's saying someone needed answers. Bruce, we need answers about these pedophiles that you keep employing. Who do you have on your staff now that's a pedophile? Really? Really? Because you keep... You keep giving them jobs, and you keep shuffling them off to other places. That's what people need answers on. They don't need answers. <laughs> You're crazy, man. They don't need answers on the New and Old Testament. They need answers on why do you keep hiring pedophiles, and why do you keep allowing them to get away with pedophilia? That's what we need answers on. Not whether people believe the Old New Testament. I'll continue reading. I hope. I wonder why some folks will not get out their Bibles do the hard work and study. Get off social media and study. Yeah, because social media is killing him right now. That's why. The Bible has answers. Find them. How could someone be saved and attend a Bible preaching church for years and not have his faith locked down? I don't know, because the shit that you preach is nuts. That's how. That's how you can't have your faith locked down. Just, <laughs> again, he is on a rabbit trail when in reality the person that said we need answers are those of us that are saying like, hey, we need some answers on your, your antics here at, at Faith Baptist Church. Like, we don't need answers on from the Bible. I'm not here to condemn the Bible. But like, we're not looking for answers from the King James Bible, which by the way is the only Bible he preaches out of, only Bible he thinks is inspired by God. That's not what we need answers on. We don't need you to say, well, here's, here's the thing. <laughs> this guy's nuts. You read the Bible, that's all good and fine. That was penned long before 1611, translated for us in 1611, the Bible he's referring to. And you're saying a Bible, a book that was written in 1611, is going to provide the answers for why I let pedophiles walk. It's really not, though. It's not. The prophet Hosea said this My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they. Because thou hast rejected knowledge. Again, I'm not good at my KJV anymore. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt not be priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of God, I will also forget thy children. Again, Old Testament. Hellfire and brimstone. Every other verse, guys. And no, I'm not giving the reference. Find it yourself, he says. <laughs> All right, sassy man. If one would read the Bible much, he would know that it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. Rightly dividing the word of truth, another verse to find. Bruce wants you to go on, and he reveals at the end that it's because of Charles Spurgeon, who smoked cigars and I'm sure drank whiskey like I am now, and Bruce would have nothing to do with that because legalism. Studying is natural to the child of God to read, to compare spiritual things with spiritual, another verse that you have to look up. I love, I love that this is a homework assignment. <laughs> School just started out here, man. Like, give us a break. And to look at a verse and see how it relates to another verse is natural. If there is no desire to learn or study on your own, you might examine yourself. Whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Another verse. <laughs> He's loving this. Prove your own self. Forget about the, oh my God. I, I read this over earlier, but I must have skimmed this. The next statement is, forget about the internet. And that probably will be the title of this episode. That is classic Jack Hiles. I can't tell you how many times I was told, I was told as a child, as a young adult, as a student at Hiles Anderson College, just to Google Jack Hiles, just to Google Hiles Anderson College. And while I didn't have a problem Googling boobs and such, I had a problem Googling that. Why? Because I was expressly told not to because the internet's full of lies. In fact, I had a friend of mine who was a great impersonator come on 
God a couple years ago, and we did a, a fake Ray Young interview, and he said, you know, you can tell by how there's a dis disloyal <laughs> uh, website when it says www at the beginning of it. That's what Bruce is. That's what Bruce is saying. Let me find it again. That was so good. Forget about the internet. What the what? What? Forget about the internet. The information highway. The thing that's full of articles about how you're an absolute, as he would call it, reprobate. Forget about the internet. Okay, bro. Not happening. The internet is destroying you. That's why you want us to forget about it. Forget the commentaries and study Bible. Read, pray, and ask the Lord to guide you into truth. Another verse. And teach you. The Holy Spirit is sent to remind us. Another verse. <laughs> He's going to be DJ, uh, IFB DJ Kaladin. Another verse. <laughs> That's hilarious. Not to point us to some writer about whom we know nothing. Go to God and ask him, where is God? I, Bruce, here's the thing. I've been in Bruce's office. I've sat in front of that ornate wooden desk before and asked him for help, asked him for advice. You're an actual, tangible human. And I'm not, and this is not me saying there's no God. Please don't misconstrue that. But I can go to Bruce's office. Well, I could <laughs> back in the day. People can go to your office. You're a tangible human. They can ask you questions. Don't tell us to go to God to find out why you let pedophiles walk. That's not how it works. That's not real life. You can't have someone say, hey, this guy in your church was a pedophile. All three of these guys were pedophiles. Accused or, or, or accused, convicted or not, they were pedophiles. And we want to know what's going on. Well, you need to talk to God about that. What? That's what he's saying. You're nuts. That's not real life. Anyways, um, now I've lost where I was. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is sent to remind us, in other words, not to point uh, to some writer about whom we know nothing. Go to God and ask him, open thou my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. In other words, by the way, that's uh, Psalms 100, I'm pretty sure. So, <laughs> um, God made the hearing ear and the seeing eye. In other words, we should seek his wisdom and instruction. I really wish I had the time and the Photoshop skills to superimpose his face onto DJ Khaled's and use that as the thumbnail here, but uh, it's not going to happen. We ought to be ready to give an answer to every man. Another verse. And not be silly, childish Christians tossed about with every wind of doctrine. Yes, another verse. Um, I wish I did, had a better DJ Khaled impression. Um, in reading sermons by Charles Spurgeon, here we go, I noticed that he quotes dozens of verses, but he rarely mentions where the verses are found. I mean, <laughs> I don't blame him. It's easier that way. I assume his audience knew their Bible. No, he just was being lazy. I don't blame him. I wouldn't have to, I wouldn't want to have to put the address down either. Without social media popping up at every stoplight and every break in their schedules, they probably had much time to think and reflect on the things of the good, but no, they had to work from sun up to sun down. It was 18, whatever it was, or 19, early 19 hundreds, whatever it was. It wasn't, it wasn't because there was a lack of social media. It was because they were, Fighting for life, <laughs> like not like we are now. All right, Bruce, you're so out of touch. Um, without television, they probably could lay in bed and remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. That's David, I think. They might have been folks who, on purpose, stayed up late meditating on the Bible instead of watching the ooh, the new Marvel. Pat Cook is calling you out. The new Marvel movie or listening to the rants of sportscasters. Or Fox News reporters. I feel like he does all those things. That, that's what, that's one thing that I did as, as an assistant pastor. So maybe he doesn't. But uh, we, as as IFB pastors, we we can't hold to that standard. It's ridiculous. Sorry, I'm putting myself in that group for just a moment. We're held to ridiculous. We all were, right? But as IFB pastors, we had to uphold these ridiculous standards. So we would call out people for the things that we did because we knew they were doing them too because we're all humans. This is the Spider-Man meme, right? And it's just funny to me that he calls out Marvel movies because we, you know, they just dropped Avengers uh, Endgame. It's a big one. And um, I don't know, it's just funny to me that he calls those things out specifically. Like, dude, you're, you're doing those things. That's why you're calling them out. Earlier I mentioned Jose in the statement, Jose in the statement, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt 
Be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. End of quote. Our nation, our children, and our personal walk with God depend upon our knowing God and his word. If you have not read your Bible yet today, stop reading my words and pick up the eternal book. Signed, Pastor. The guy is a joke. He's a joke. It is ridiculous, the stuff that he's saying. It doesn't make any sense. It is not adding up. It doesn't add up at all. And the reason being because he's, he he starts out this, this paragraph with reconciling the Old and the New Testament. Are you kidding me? The Old Testament is crazy. It's bonkers. But here you are saying it's all true and it all needs to be believed. Again, there's so much to say about Bruce, but I just wanted you to know that that is his idea of responding to him employing multiple pedophiles. This is his response. 100% this is his response. All right. So we're also going to talk about Gaylord. Um, Grace Baptist pastor, founder, resigns after months of controversy. So the way this is going to set up for IFB, for this church in, I think it was North Carolina, but we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, the church that, that um, John Jenkins is shuffling himself to, the way it's going to be put is he didn't resign. The Lord, excuse me, led him to another work, and he's going to help those people at that church. That's 100% the narrative that we're dealing with here. So just know that. The Gaylor Grace Baptist Church founding pastor is leaving after 33 years in the region's ministry. Here's the thing. You don't establish yourself, establish a church, establish your family, have children, found a Bible college, have multiple conferences. I'm trying to my thumbs up over here. Have multiple conferences with people like Jack Scott, Derek Hagelin. The list goes on and on. I'm sure you had Bob, Bob Hooker in a few times. But like you don't have all of that for 33 years. Ooh, isn't that how old Jesus was? Um, you don't have all that for, for 33 years and then up and leave after accusations and people are convicted of sexual abuse. It's not, here's the thing, it's not a effing coincidence, okay? It's not a coincidence. He, to use a Louis L'Amour term, maybe one person out there might get it, he lit a shuck out of Gaylord and Grace Baptist because he knew if he stayed, at the very least, he's going to actually, unlike Bruce Goddard, have to deal with the fallout, have to deal with the accusations, have to deal with the convictions, have to deal with the people that are getting locked up for pedophilia. He's going to have to. So instead of doing what Bruce does and sticking his head in the sand, sorry, he said, I'm out. And because John Jenkins has a decent name and has, has, has to be fair, worked really hard and manipulated a lot of people and been an absolute asshole... He's been able to build a great work for the Lord in Gaylord, Michigan. I know I've, I've been there a few times. So, yeah, yeah John Jenkins, same, same thing. So, <laughs> I don't know if you guys are watching this. Every once in a while, I see something pop up at an opportune moment. So, that's John Jenkins. Let's talk about John Jenkins. Let's talk about Gaylord. Let's talk about Grace Baptist Church. An announcement on the church's website shows John Jenkins resigned as pastor of Grace Baptist Church July 7th to take a position as a pastor at a North Carolina Baptist church. As the founder and visionary of Grace, Pastor Jenkins' leadership has guided our church family through storms, trials, challenges, deaths, and hardships. A lot of which he created. My own brother's death, he almost created. Thank goodness, thank the Lord, thank whatever. My brother's still with us. But that church, that college, almost created my brother's death. So you can fuck off with that but also through prosperity, new life, expansions, and a level of growth rarely seen in a, such a rural area. Reads part of the church's announcement. It's not a big church, by the way. It was built up so hard, the tour groups just hit it so hard. I have friends who can speak to this, friends on Facebook here. They hit it so hard that when I, I went for their, I think I went as a teenager. Yeah, yeah, I went as a teenager first for their teen spectacular thing. I was like, this is it? This is the whole church? Because I'm used to First Baptist Hammond and not putting anyone on the pedestal. I've done that enough. But First Baptist Hammond, Jack Hollis, Jack Scott, it's big. It's huge. Gaylord, not that big. This move comes months after months of attention over accusations and criminal sexual conduct cases that have surfaced with ties to the church and its school dating back about 17 years. 
In a previous Herald Times story, Jenkins commented on instances of abuse or alleged abuse involving church members. Jenkins said he had reported two of the school's former teachers to police for sexual abuse of students years ago. And I don't know if this article will cover it, but that was found not to be the case. He lied. Excuse me. Jenkins said he reported former teacher Aaron Willand, Wyland, I think, I could be mispronouncing that, to Michigan State Police, and later another former teacher to the Otsego, again, I could be mispronouncing that as well, County Sheriff's Department. Wyland, Willand Wyland was convicted in Washington State of raping a child and child molestation in 2006. The survivor, now an adult, is also seeking charges in Otsego County for abuse. She said also occurred in Michigan. Willand has been charged in Michigan. Jenkins said he also reported former teacher David Beckner to the Otsego County Sheriff's Department in 2011. Eight criminal sexual conduct charges, wow, have been officially filed by Otsego County Courts against Beckner. The case was bound over to Otsego County's 46th Circuit Court on Thursday. This article was written, sorry, I should note, on July 15th of this year, so a little over a month ago. Was Herald Times Freedom of Information Act, FOIA, Requests for Michigan State Police reports filed by Grace Baptist show no police reports filed by Grace Baptist with any references to Aaron Willen or David Beckner. John Jenkins, who is now since, and we're going to talk about taking another church, was a lying and covering up for pedophiles. Clark Martin, a former congregation member and a volunteer bus driver, was convicted of criminal sexual conduct against a former Grace Baptist student in 2002 and 2003. According to Otsego County, uh, I, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that because I'm saying it a lot. Uh, so Chelsea or Andrew, whoever watches this, I'm sorry guys. In that case, Martin has also molested another youth, a 12-year-old boy in St. Clair County in 1996. Martin also pled guilty and made a criminal sexual conduct charges for allegedly molesting a teen boy in 1991 and 1992. Again, as far as I know, before arriving at Bruce, at Bruce <laughs> same thing at John Jenkins Church. Former Grace Baptist congregation members Jennifer Mahoney and Matthew Mahoney were convicted in 2013 on felony charges against a 15-year-old girl in Indiana, according to previous coverage by the Tribune, Star, Terre Haute, Indiana newspaper and court documents. A former Gaylord Teen Spectacular Youth Conference guest speaker, Jack Scott, <laughs> more familiar with him, was convicted in 2013 in federal court in Indiana after he transported a 16-year-old girl to his cabin in northern Michigan for the purpose of having sex with her, according to court documents. It was proven and he has been jailed since. According to previous Herald Times coverage of the Teen Spectacular, Scop of Hammond, Indiana, was listed as a visiting guest speaker during the 2011 Youth Conference, an event that draws hundreds of teens in Gaylord. That is true. Jenkins previously confirmed that each of the above was connected to Grace Baptist as a teacher, through the congregation or as a guest speaker. He said Grace Baptist implemented a new policy following the recent public focus on the school staff. The policy details ways to better avoid and address issues at the school and such and church with a strong emphasis throughout the document on the topic of sexual abuse. Again, that still doesn't, number one, that you can't make background, check retro, background checks retroactive. So that's the issue there. There were no, there were not background checks, and I almost guarantee you, if we continue reading, we're not going to find that there are. That's going to be updated. That there now will be background checks. Jenkins previously told the Herald Times that the school and church would start using background checks for all staff and volunteers. He said prior to this year, the church and school did not use background checks when hiring. Guys, thirty-three years of ministry of kindergarten, elementary, junior high, high school, college. Church, Sunday school teachers, bus drivers, school superintendents, school presidents, and no background checks? Is this a joke? Are you serious? One former staff member whose daughter was molested by a fellow student previously told the Herald Times she had taken issue with the way Jenkins handled the situation after the abuse occurred off campus. Uh, Sarah Sandella said Jenkins had not kept the teen offender away from the church and school where her five-year-old daughter attended and when Sandellas had taught, where Sandellas had taught from 2016 to 2018. My apologies if I'm mispronouncing the last name there. Several former Grace Baptist students have shared their stories about the former teachers who have either been convicted from, or sorry, for criminal sexual conduct against minors or are currently facing charges for the same thing. 
Several of the students and alleged victims have also pointed to Jenkins' role as a leader of the church during the time and the requirements to report allegations to police. David Gibbs responded on behalf of the Fellowship Baptist Church in Clinton, North Carolina, and said the church conducted a national search for its next pastor. Okay. The fixer comments. He said the church is looking forward to having Jenkins as a pastor. After much prayer, I can't do the voice. Uh, my buddy can do the voice. After much prayer, national search. That's it. That's all I got. Fellowship Baptist Church asked Pastor John Jenkins from Gaylord to be a candidate at our church. Gibbs said in an email, our founding pastor, Dr. Charles Ennis, Charles Ennis, was planning to retire after 51 years of ministry. A number of things stood out about Pastor Jenkins. Mostly that, you know, he doesn't have a problem with pedophiles, so if we have any more, like, he'll let them slide, right? Gibbs said Jenkins' scope of ministry and type of programs offered at Grace Baptist, such as radio and college, are similar to fellowships, and the church leadership was impressed. <laughs> Y'all about to be impressed. His preaching and communication skills are outstanding. No, 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 no. John Jenkins is a fucking dick. Don't get me started on preaching and communication skills. The way my family members were treated when they attended Grace Baptist College, when they paid that man's salary, when they paid to attend that church and that college, are mm, unacceptable at best. Don't tell me about John Jenkins' communication skills. Or his preach. I don't care. John Jenkins, he's just a blowhard. That's all John is. His doctrinal positions lined up with our historic Baptist faith. Of course he did. His spirit of compassion. No compassion for church members and hurting people in the community are exemplary. <laughs> no, this guy doesn't have compassion. This guy's an asshole. His prior church's policies and procedures. Let me just stop you right there. You remember we just said there were no background checks for 30 plus years? That's his church's, his prior church's policies and procedures, including the child protection policies and procedures that clearly outline zero tolerance. Again, the fact that you have to, the fact that you have to, you know, as, as a spokesperson for the church, out, you know, make it very clear that, you know, the, make it so clear about how, you know, there's no child, no tolerance for child abuse. Like that tolerance for, no tolerance for child, no shit. It's a church. It should be a safe haven. As Pat Cook said, church should be a safe place. But yet you have to go into detail about how there's zero tolerance for child. Of course there's zero tolerance for child abuse. I mean, there clearly wasn't at Grace Baptist. But there should be. Why should that be a highlight of any church ever? Like, that's a given. That's a no-brainer. All right, I'm just angry. <laughs> um, all suspicions of child abuse to be reported to the authorities. We're consistent with our church, Gibbs said. We believe that if a child is safe anywhere, they should be safe at church. That doesn't make pedophiles disappear. That doesn't make sweeping things under the rug not happen. The church also conducted a due diligence check on Jenkins' background and reference checks. Again, I love the way we're skating around the word background, the words, the phrase background check. A due diligence check on Jenkins' background. Can you just say background check, or did you not do a background check so you can't legally say that? Just saying. After this process was concluded, Pastor Jenkins was unanimously selected by the church leadership board and pulpit committee, was recommended by the retiring founding pastor of 51 years, recommended by a number of church leaders nationwide, and was voted in by a super, major super majority. <laughs> super majority is 99%, okay? Super majority of the church members over 75%. Here's my thing with voting in a new pastor and not getting all the vote. Doesn't that suck as the pastor? I'm t let's just be real. Let's just be human. Aren't you constantly, because he got uh, over 75 Okay, so let's say 76%. Let's, say, let's be generous. Let's say he got voted in with 80% vote. Aren't you always looking over your shoulder for that 20%? But like, really, like, I would always be like, who was the 20%? And you'll know pretty quick because <laughs> they either left or they are not happy. On, you can see them Sunday morning. Like, I've heard so many illustrations about that. I've made it myself. But, like, <laughs> all right. So that's John Jenkins. And there's so much more to say on that. And we owe the survivors, the victims, um, the Blind Eye original group. Make sure you, if you're Googling or Googling, Googling, if you're on Facebook or if you're Googling, information on Grace Baptist, John Jenkins and that whole mess. 
um, the blind eye, uh, blind eye movement original group is who you want to look for. They've got great and compelling and helpful information um, if you're looking for it. This whole debacle in Gaylord deserves its own podcast, its own recording, its own hour, two, three, four hours of, hey, let's delve deep into this. And I do, my goal is to have that done within the next few months. So uh, look forward to that because I am going to be working on that. Now. It, or maybe we'll, if I can, we might actually do a live episode where we have some of the survivors come on and talk about that. Feel free to drop me a comment, shoot me a PM, let me know if that's something that you'd like to see the live episode. I know live episodes aren't your absolute fave, but if that's something you'd like to see with uh, survivors from Grace Baptist, I'd love to hear about it. So anyways, that's, that's all for that for the moment. But what I want to move on to is mandated reporters what that looks like and what the consequences are. Today we're looking at Bruce Goddard, Jack Treber, Tom and Greg Neal, Bob Gray, and John Jenkins. The fact that they are mandated reporters, we're gonna give you the definition of that and then also look at the consequences of not doing your job as a mandated reporter. What is a mandated reporter? I'm pulling this from uh, social work, uh, sorry, Social, socialworkdegreeguide.com. A mandated reporter is a person who, because of his or her profession, is legally required to report any suspicion of child, child abuse or neglect to the relevant authorities. These laws are in place to prevent children from being abused and to end any possible abuse or neglect at the earliest possible stage. Um, who is considered a mandated reporter? Again, reading from the site. The official designation of which professions are considered mandated reporters varies somewhat from state to state. However, in most cases, the definition concerns anyone who works closely with a vulnerable population. I could not, that could not be any more accurate than your IFB congregation, such as children or the elderly. This typically includes social workers, teachers, healthcare workers, child care providers, law enforcement, mental health professionals, and other educators and medical professionals, although certain states hold that all citizens are mandated reporters. And good for those states, because we all should be. Under what circumstances must mandated reporters contact authorities? These standards vary from state to state, but the spirit of the laws are the same. Mandated reporters should notify the proper authorities in any case in which they have reason to believe that a child is being abused, or neglected or that conditions exist in the home that may result in abuse or neglect. In most states, reports are anonymous and there are no repercussions for making a report. So there is no reason not to err on the side of caution and report any suspicion in which a child's welfare may be at risk. At minimum, a report must include all known information about the abuse or neglect suspected along with information about any actions taken to, taken to assist the child and contact information of the reporter. If a child discloses abuse, you should absolutely report it to proper authorities after assuring the child that you believe them and will take steps to help. Bruce, Jack, Tom, Greg, and there's one more, who am I forgetting? John, you guys are all guilty of not even, not, not just, not just, not just not reporting, but like pushing kids, teenagers, young adults aside and saying, your life has no worth, your feelings have no meaning here, and I don't give a shit about you. I'm here to make money off the backs of people who are willing to bend over backwards for me and for the person that I call God. And I don't care if you got molested. I don't care if you are emotionally damaged for the remainder of your life because of what I said or did or how I treated you. I don't care. I'm here to make money. I'm here to do as I please. And you don't fit into my equation. So either I'm not gonna listen to you and, and push what you said aside, or I'm gonna pretend to listen to you and shuffle off the person that has abused you sexually or otherwise, or just physically abused you. Not, you know, not, not trying to differentiate. They're just saying like, I'm going to shuffle that person off and put them somewhere else. And you are getting no closure, no justice, none whatsoever. What are the responsibilities of mandated reporters? Well, in this category, 
While people in this category are required to report suspected abuse or neglect, they are not required to, and in fact should in no circumstances, serve as investigators. Now this gets into a little bit of a tricky uh, spot with a few people, but I do want to read it. That means that there is no reason to ask the child questions or to try to get to the bottom of the suspected abuse. The correct course of action is to make a report so that the trained authorities may investigate. Again, I couldn't agree with that anymore. Like that is, these people are like, we, I just told you guys earlier, we don't even have GED level degrees. <laughs> we don't have, we don't have the authority. We don't have the wherewithal. We don't have the know-how to deal with this. But there are people that do. And our job is to, oh my God, that happened to you? Okay, I'm gonna give it over to the authorities because I wanna make sure that we do right by you, not sweep it under the rug. Lost my place here. The correct course of action is to make a report so that the trained authorities may investigate. However, mandated reporters may collect information in support of their report, such as photographs or x-rays of any injuries. It is typically not required to inform the child's family that you have a re you have made a report. However, those who work for a hospital or educational facility, ding, 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 Christian school, may be required to make such a notification depending on their jurisdiction. Keep in mind that even if you are not considered a reporter in your state, even if you're not considered a reporter, you're still encouraged to report suspect suspected child abuse and or neglect. Err on the side of caution. Even if you're not, even if your state state's laws aren't as rigid. Indiana is. I love Indiana, but unfortunately, they're very very lenient. Even if your state's laws aren't really strict, just err on the side of caution and take care. Look, I have a kid. She's six years old. Take care of the kids. Like I, I, I don't know. Like I'm about to start crying here. I'm sure I am. But like, are you are you kidding me? They're children. They're innocent. They didn't do anything to deserve this. And you're just churning them under the wheel of your ministry. It's so sad. And so, so avoidable. So easily avoidable. Anyways, that's what a mandated reporter is. And that's how that works. Now, let me read to you something that these guys don't want to think about. But... It's true. Penalties for failure to report and false reporting of child abuse and neglect. Many cases of child abuse and neglect are not reported, even when mandated by law. Therefore, nearly every state and U.S. territory imposes penalties, often in the form of a fine or imprisonment or excuse me, mandatory reporters who fail to report suspected child abuse or neglect as required by law. In addition, to prevent malicious or intentional reporting of cases that are not founded, many states in the U.S. Virgin Islands impose penalties against any person who files a report known to be false, which I fully agree. So there's a whole lot to read here. I'm going to read you a little bit of it. Um, penalties for failure to report. Approximately 49 states, the District of Columbia, American Samoa, Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands, excuse me, impose penalties on mandatory reporters who knowingly or willfully fail to make a report when they suspect that a child is being abused or neglected in Florida, Florida, Jacksonville's in Florida, a mandatory reporter who fails to report, hey, Tom and Greg Neal, this might, I don't think you guys will ever watch this, this might be interesting for you. A mandatory reporter who fails to report as required by law can be charged with a felony. Failure to report is classified as a misdemeanor or a similar charge in 40 states in America and Samoa, Guam, and, other, and the Virgin Islands. Misdemeanors are upgraded to felonies for failure to report more serious situations in Arizona. In Connecticut, Illinois, Kentucky, and Guam, second or subsequent violations are classified as felonies. Illinois is interesting uh, for because it's right across the right across the street basically from Hammond. Upon conviction, a mandated reporter who fails to report can face terms, face jail terms ranging from 30 days to five years, fines ranging from $300 to $10,000, or both jail terms and fines. The reporter may be civilly liable for any damages caused by the failure to report. Florida, I love that we keep coming back to Florida. And Niels, listen up. Florida imposes a fine of up to $1 million 
on any institution, Emmanuel Baptist Church, of higher learning, oh, okay, the college, cool, including any state university and non-public education, that's you guys, who fails to report or prevents any person from reporting an instance of abuse committed on the property of the institution or at any event sponsored by the institution. Man, in Maryland, here we go, an agency participating in child abuse or neglect investigation that has reason to suspect that a child, sorry, that a healthcare pr practitioner, police officer, or educator, educator, has failed to report as required, must file a complaint with that professional's respective licensing authority. It goes on and on. Like, if you want this resource, I will gladly go ahead and shoot it to you. It's childwelfare.gov, and there's a PDF that outlines all this. I just feel like I'm getting a little too nitty gritty. Um, here's the thing, and I will, I'll be done with, I'll close <laughs> with this. Um, what these pedophiles have done is just, it's unbelievable. It's sad at best. And it's something that, I wouldn't say luckily, but thank goodness, is finally being prosecuted. They're finally being locked up. They're finally getting what's coming to them. And that's good, and we need that, and that's important. And I don't um, I don't want to diminish or take away from any of that because that all has its place, and that's pretty much what this podcast has been about up until this point. But the point that I want to make is that Jack Treber, Bruce Goddard, Tom Neal, Greg Neal, Bob Gray, Sr., saying the junior doesn't have his own problems because he does and john jenkins you guys are all 100 percent mandated reporters lucky is a tough word i don't like using it but we've been blessed let's say that that a lot of the perpetrators are getting locked up uh, the police are paying attention um, and these guys are getting busted left and right and that is so amazing but let's not forget about mandated reporters. Let's not forget about guys who want to be chancellors of a college, pastors of a church, presidents of colleges. President, chancellor, same same thing. Let's not forget about those guys who are who are letting these people do just unspeakable things to children and are walking and are thinking, I didn't do anything wrong. I I didn't know or I didn't I didn't have to report it. No, no, no. You had to. You had an institution for them. You had a school. You had a college. You had a church where these things went on. And again, we're not asking you to be detectives. But when someone comes to you with something like this, instead of doing the two things that you have systematically and historically done, which is either shuffle them off to a different institution where they can, uh, where they can prey on other children and teenagers and young adults, or simply denying it and throwing the person out of your congregation, those aren't options. That's all you've been doing though, guys. You've just been shuffling them off or saying it simply didn't happen. And that's not the case. It's happening and you guys are in trouble for it as well. It's Again, it's not just a, oh, this person did this thing so they're guilty and they're gonna get locked up. No, no, no. You're guilty too of a failure to report. That's what you're guilty of. It's a real thing. The government takes it seriously. The law takes it seriously. And you're in trouble. Because you can't just let this stuff go on and skate. That's not how it works. Anyways, this episode went longer than I thought it was going to go. I'm grateful if you stuck around this long for that. I wanted to address not just the perpetrators, but also the pastors, the, the church leaders, the school leaders, the college leaders who would let this stuff go on and failed to report it. Because while they didn't commit the crimes, they're also liable. So feel free to, if you, if you have more information on any of these, or if I misquoted or misspoke on something, let me know. Shoot me a PM, leave a comment here on the podcast. I'd love to hear from you. But I wanted to get to these three big things in Gaylord, Wildemar, and Jacksonville slash Maryland. I wanted to cover those three big things that are going on in the IFB right now the problems with them, the issues with them, and the fact that, yes, we are we are thrilled, we're excited, we're happy, we are jubilant that the criminals are coming to justice, but we're not leaving out 
the mandated reporters, who not only let this, these things transpire, but either turned a blind eye to the crimes or shuffled the criminals off to a different institution to continue to prey on children and young adults. Again, I know this has been an intense episode. It's been a long episode, but it's long overdue. And I thank you guys so much for sticking around for this episode, the squeaky solo cast of Not Your Mother's Podcast.